in Afghanistan. It's not, it's not the Taliban, though, right? Some of it is the Taliban, but far from all of it is the Taliban. So the Taliban is involved in the drug traffic as well? Very much so, very deeply, as it was in the 1990s. And uh, so is al-Qaeda involved in the drug traffic? And There's a big um, controversy surrounding that. All the evidence indicates only very tangential links. And certainly in the early 1990s, al-Qaeda took a decision not to participate in the drug trade, even as the Taliban was deeply involved. Uh, it's not clear that the decision still is holds. It, it, is it your, I mean, you, uh, do you in your book, do you cover the uh, possibility of the government of Afghanistan and officials within the Afghan government being involved in the drug traffic? Yes, absolutely. That is very strong evidence that from the lowest levels to very high levels, uh, officials of the Afghan government, officials of the uh, Afghan national police especially, are deeply involved in aspects of the drug trade and drug cultivation, which is not surprising given that half of the country's GDP comes from drugs. Consequently, political arrangements are very much linked to the opium trade. So is Afghanistan uh, fairly then described as a narco state, given the fact that they're producing uh, all these drugs and uh, it depends on its for it? Uh, I don't like to use uh, such labels. I okay. don't think it's useful for policy. I don't think there are any definitions. But certainly, the intensity of the problem is far greater than we have seen anywhere in the world since um, World War II. The what should the U.S. be doing in Afghanistan with respect to uh, dealing with this tremendous uh, outflow of drugs during the time that the U.S. has a presence there. What, the what the could we be one, doing? The uh, number one um, factor is to establish security. Without establishing security, no counter-narcotics policy, whether it's eradication or rule development, will be effective. Once security is established or as security is being established, then the focus needs to be on building state that is capacious, uh, and that is also uh, uh, accountable to its people. But if, we, if there's a state that depends on its income for this drug production, so what, 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 hope, so what, hope, what hope is there that any kind of security would eradicate the, uh, the uh, drug Security is a necessary production. requisite, but it's not um, sufficient. The other component then needs to be building state that can uh, generate legal livelihoods, that can assist in generating legal livelihoods, and that can also generate access to justice uh, and have effective law enforcement. This is inevitably a very long-term process. Given the scale of institutional underdevelopment in Afghanistan and the scale of the drug problem, there can be no hope that it can be accomplished. How many, years, how many years has Afghanistan been a significant international player in the production of, uh, of drugs, whether we're talking about opium or heroin? Since the mid-1990s, it's the number one country in the world. Okay, Mr. Nadelman, you had uh, something you wanted to say. Yeah, I, I just wanted to try to put this in some historical perspective, because while Afghanistan is in some respects unique, as Vanda mentioned, um, there have been hearings in the past that focused on Burma as producing 80 percent, or Turkey, or Mexico, or Colombia, or what have you. And so it could well be the case that in 10 or 15 or 20 years, Afghanistan's a non-issue, and it's now someplace in Africa, or elsewhere in Central Asia, or back elsewhere. I think it's important to realize this. If you could suddenly, if the U.S. or anybody, or the mullahs, could suddenly wave a wand, and poof, no more opium or heroin coming out of Afghanistan, what would be the implications for the American drug problem, the global drug problem for security? You know that so long as there's a demand, there will be a supply. You know that Afghanistan was taken out, it would emerge back in the northwest frontier of Pakistan, back in Burma, back closer to U.S. borders. I mean, Peter Reuter mentioned this as well. We don't know where, and it could well be that the disruptive implications in terms of U.S. economic and security interests and in terms of the economic and human rights interests of others would be even worse, would be even more badly impaired. So I think that the answer with Afghanistan is not to focus on reducing the supply of opium from Afghanistan. It's to focus, as Venice suggested, on, on in ensuring the stability of Afghanistan and looking at it from the perspective of Afghan security, NATO, and U.S. interests. We can talk all we want, of course, about economic development being the answer to reducing drug supply, but America is one of the most economically developed countries in the world, and that hasn't stopped us from being a major producer of marijuana and methamphetamine and a host of other illicit why drugs is there as such well. A, you know, why is there such a demand, uh, what's your opinion or considered opinion on why there's such a high demand for drugs in this country, let's say? 
Well, you know, we are not that dramatically off from other countries. I mean, we have somewhat higher rates of use than, for example, European countries. But the, you know, Pakistan and Iran have a higher per capita use of opium and heroin than does the United States. And some European countries use higher rates as well. I mean, let's face it, there's never been a drug-free society in human history, except maybe the Eskimos because they couldn't grow anything. But apart from them, there has never really been one. There's never going to be one. Uh, you know, there's going to be a consumption of alcohol and tobacco products, caffeinated beverages, you name it. The real question in the long term is not how do we keep trying to build a moat between all these drugs and ourselves or our children. The real question is how do we come up with sensible ways of learning how to live with this reality so that we reduce the negative consequences of drug use and of our prohibitionist policies as much as possible. Uh, and in your testimony, what you've said is that uh, there's been a failure to adequately evaluate drug policies as to how they can meet uh, mm -hmm. the challenge of, uh, of drug use. Yeah. Well, you know, harm reduction refers on the one hand to needle exchange programs. Harm reduction can be simply defined as those policies and interventions that seek to reduce the negative consequences of drug use by and among those people who are unable or unwilling to stop today. But you can also define harm reduction in policy terms as those that seek to reduce the, ne reduce the negative consequences of drug use and the negative consequences of our drug policies. That's where I think the criteria need to go. That's where I would encourage this committee to push or mandate that ONDCP and the Obama administration move in that well, direction. Well, I, I thought it was very interesting when Mr. Uh, Kurlikowski uh, would not want to get into a description of harm reduction. I wonder what the AMA would say to that since essentially the father of medicine uh, this first rule is do no harm. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. I mean, it's interesting, in the Commission on Narcotic Drugs and in international channels, the Europeans sort of hear uh, Director Krolikowski say this, and they sort of roll their eyes and think it's foolish. But it's not just the Europeans. I was in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, two years ago, listening to a speech by the deputy drug czar of Malaysia. They have very harsh policies. And he said, we have three components of our national drug control strategy, supply reduction, demand reduction, and harm reduction. Now, if you could have people both in Europe, but also people in Asia who are saying this thing, I'm baffled at why uh, ONDCP is unable to use this language. Note, by the way, that the deputy drug czar, Tom McLellan, did begin to embrace the language of harm reduction some months ago, but appears to have been repudiated in the interim. Dr. Carnavali. Why do you believe that the administration's rhetoric about moving to a public health model view of drug control has not been matched with changing funding priorities? For example, is it attributable to a lack of authority of ONDCP or a lag time in getting the right people in place? Uh, do you believe with ONDCP's current structure and current political climate that they have the institutional, political, and uh, um, political uh, wherewithal to change drug budget policies and priorities? Uh, that's a very good question, and, and, and I, let me start by saying, quite frankly, when I saw the budget that did come out, I was really surprised that it, we, we did not see large increases in demand reduction and very large cuts and decreases in supply reduction, and I was hoping that would happen. Um, with regard to ONDCP's authorities, it does have the legal authorities to shape a budget, make recommendations independent of the OMB, directly to the President. and. Um, my sense is that uh, in the new administration, when the, when the director came on board, um, there was a reshuffling of, of sort of the deck chairs and the, the loss of cabinet status to me is, is one issue that I think is, that, uh, is playing into this. Second, I think the fiscal climate, um, from what I can hear from my friends at OMB, I, if I can call them friends uh, given the disappointment I have with the budget, um, is that this simply was not a lot of money, but I kept saying that that's no excuse for not cutting ineffective programs on the supply side. I do think ONDCP has the authorities. Um, uh, the issue is whether or not it, it um, how it uses, is whether it uses them effectively. Uh, and I'm, you know, at this point hopeful that uh, at least uh, the director can do something more positive to to shift resources. Well, but let, let me ask you, and I'd, I'd like uh, uh, I'd, I'd like you, uh, I'd like each of the panelists to respond to this question. Looking forward to the reauthorization of the ONDCP, what institutional changes 
do you believe, should be made to ensure that it has the authority to truly affect policy formulation and spending? What would you recommend? Let's start with uh, Mr. Carnevale and go down the one of the concerns I have is the structure of the agency itself is, is now flawed. It was built when and designed back in 1988. We were, uh, the Congress designed an agency to fight a cocaine problem, uh, stopping drugs from coming in the United States. The Reagan administration budget then had a budget that was close to 80 percent focused on supply reduction because it viewed cocaine as, as the problem in America. Um, we have an Office of Demand Reduction, Supply Reduction, and there was an Office of State and Local Affairs that was designed or intended to help sort of spread that policy to state and local governments so it would truly be a national drug control policy. Uh, the current structure with the Office of Supply Reduction I think needs to be changed. It continues to um, uh, dominate the scene in terms of what's going on with the drug budget inappropriately. And if, I think that if we're moving more towards a public health model, we should consider that structure and design. It doesn't make sense to me that we have five political Senate-confirmed appointees in an agency of about 100 people, uh, one for each of these areas, demand, supply, state and local, and of course the director. I would um, reconsider that, and um, I would want supply reduction programs maybe to be viewed as more of a program office, not headed up with such a high-level official. Mr. Nadelman. Yeah, uh, I would take one lesson for ONDCP from the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime, the UNODC, which has not been notably, notably successful in its work, but to the extent it has been, it's because it developed its own branch for harm reduction. The, f the most dynamic and successful aspect of UNODC has been that branch, and I would encourage uh, ONDCP to create the position of a deputy director for harm reduction. It's not sufficient to simply rely on people, for example, the, the two very uh, talented former New York City health commissioners who now chair the CDC and uh, FDA, Peggy Hamburg and Tom Frieden. There needs to be more of a dedicated presence within ONDCP. I also think that, secondly, building in a capacity for independent evaluation, as well as some element to try to push forward on independent strategic thinking that's been notably absent, not just from ONDCP, but to my knowledge, also within the State Department, within the defense community, and within the intelligence community. There needs to be an element within the U.S. government, and it might appropriately be situated within ONDCP, so long as it is to some extent politically independent, to encourage more strategic thinking about policy options. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Felbert Brown. If ONDCP is to remain in the role of being uh, the national agency setting uh, counter-narcotics policy, it needs to not only have a standing comprehensive approach domestically, but also internationally. Consequently, interagency working groups need to be mandated and on the matter of the director's choice, including defense, uh, state, um, justice, uh, et cetera, all the, other, uh, all the other agencies, so that policy is set on the basis what truly is in the U.S. national interest and what recognizes the effects on communities and states abroad. Uh, I would also uh, stress uh, Dr. Nadiman's line that uh, this, this committee, and more broadly, uh, Congress should mandate that um, considering unintended consequences, second degree effects, be part of regular policy process on which ONDCP and other agencies report? Um, the premise of your question is that it should be re ONDCP should be reauthorized, and I would hope that you would uh, examine that premise before moving ahead. This is a problem which was acute at, in the late 1980s and is now not acute. It is a, a, a substantial but sort of routine, routinized problem. If it is to be continued, then I do think that the questions that the committee members uh, posed today to Director Kolakowski were very much about cost effectiveness and in general assessing uh, programs uh, that have been carried out. ONDCP is uniquely placed to do that. Dividing it up as it is now into supply reduction and demand reduction creates units that are rather defensive about their domains. There is an office of the sort of chief scientist, CTAC, which in principle could take on this evaluation responsibility and I would hope that you would strengthen its authorities and give it a clearer mandate to do just that. I want to thank each one of the witnesses for their presence and uh, before this subcommittee. Uh, there's been some uh, very positive 
testimony and some suggestions that this subcommittee will act on, including exploring the um, necessity of an independent analysis of the drug policies. Um, as we move into the reauthorization, we certainly need to be able to determine uh, the question of efficacy and effectiveness. You've raised some very important questions. This has been one of the uh, uh, best panels testifying on an issue that has such overarching importance in so many areas of the American economy and society. So I appreciate your presence here. Uh, I would ask you to be responsive to any uh, follow-up questions that members may have in writing. And we'll um, certainly keep all of you uh, posted on the future hearings, which we will have. This subcommittee does have uh, legislative uh, authority in this area, and we are going to uh, be taking very seriously our responsibility with respect to the reauthorization. I'm uh, Dennis Kucinich, Chair of the Domestic Policy Subcommittee of the Committee of Government Oversight and Reform. Uh, today's hearing has been ONDCP's fiscal year 2011 national drug control budget. Are we still funding the war on drugs? Uh, we've had um, a distinguished uh, panel, in the first panel and the second panel. I want to thank all of the individuals here for participating, and our subcommittee will continue our work in this area. For now, this hearing stands adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>